everybody, welcome to another episode of Notes from the Aleph. Aleph is a high point from which all things are visible, and from our vantage point, we'll be looking at tabletop role-playing games, their design, and the theory behind those designs. Around our here, our motto is to be fair, build up, and have fun. I'm your host, Griffin Verreau, joined, joined by our editor, Theta, our local designer, Norman Rafferty, and our good friend and GM, Lessons Learned. When it comes to tabletop role-playing games, I have 15 years of experience running, playing, and frequently fixing problematic rule sets at the table. Pronouns are he, him, they, them. Lessons, why don't you go? A pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm an author over at Amazon.com. Nine and Stars is my collection of short stories. I also run the Sunday Shadowrun game here uh, called uh, Mirror Souls, as well as being a longtime player and GM in many situations. And uh, also, I'm Lessons Learned here on Twitch and Lessons Learned also over at YouTube. And Rafferty. Hello, world. I'm Roman Rafferty. He, him, Sangman Games. Uh, I make Iron Claw, Abyss, Vital Hearts, Farflung, Madcap, bunch of stuff. Yep, all the things. And so today, our topic. So hey guys, RPGs have a lot of fighting in them. When a GM says roll initiative, that's usually the call that a fight is happening, and you're going to be there for a while. But what about when a character is being a jerk and you just want to punch them? Do we go into rounds? Does it end when he's unconscious? What about when a bird swoops in and kidnaps the bard? Is that whole chase going to be a combat? What about when you're taking turns trying to diplomatize or seduce a character? Do we go into rounds for that? So for today, we'll be discussing what exactly a combat is and when does it happen. So Okay, let's start with, because there's two questions in one. Okay, yeah, when here we go. One is combat itself, and what is initiative, and when it's required. Okay. Because initiative, I think, is whenever timing is important. Whenever you really need to know who's on first, right? And that's the idea by an initiative. Combat is any one time where life, direct life and limb, is at risk. Not so, potentially at risk. So you were saying it would be possible to have a combat encounter mm -hmm. without rolling initiative. True. Yes, that's true. Okay, see, I have to disagree with you there because I, I don't think there's any provisions. Uh, I mean, well, okay. While as a GM, you can do anything you want, I, there's a very few games that entertain the idea. Like in Vampire or, or, or Dungeons and Dragons, they do not entertain the idea that you could make an attack action. I mean, you can't take actions until it's your turn and it's not your mm -hmm. turn until you roll initiative. So you can't actually engage in a combat unless you've rolled initiative. That's true. Right. And that's why I think they go together, but we have to separate them, the two of them, because sometimes I can ask for initiative without going to combat, because I, I you really could. want to settle. You, you, um, yeah, in fact, and, that, that came up when we were editing games recently, when I was looking at Abyss, and I realized that um, there should be a difference between a combat situation and what I want to call an action sequence. Because I think one of the huge problems with modern gaming is they often call it a combat. But like you said, we could be doing everything turn by turn because it's important what everyone's doing. But we could be like on a train that's racing out of control or a lava flow could be coming towards us uh, or we're, we're escaping the city. You know, we're running away or doing something else that requires, you know, like keeping the ship from crashing into the rocks. Something that requires everyone, you know, where everyone is moment by moment and make sure that everyone gets something to do in the sequence in turn to make sure everything's happening. But we're not actually in violent confrontation with one another. So you could have initiative without combat, but you can't have combat without initiative. Yeah. And that's also why I describe it as something where immediate or near and immediate life, risk of life and limb. Well, or you care about and what's not, going on. Like if the ship yeah, crashes, we might all live, but we actually give a shit about the ship crashes. Yeah, or someone else's, you know, you know. Or act, someone else's. So act, action is is a great way to say. In fact, that's how I usually do my. Well, because drama, people talk about action. Yeah. If I if I described an action movie to you, you would might mm -hmm. say like the Avengers or James Bond, but you wouldn't call those combat movies. No you chase really, sequences, to all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah you would get the most action thriller yeah. things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, well, they would be in the genre of action, and in fact, this was mm -hmm. coming up when we were like, with, like we described Abyss as an action horror game, and I, I would also like to start calling them action sequences instead, because yeah. uh, well, really, where where this comes up is there's always this huge problem of, um, well, not a huge problem. This can be a huge problem 
where someone says, like in the middle, or tries to ambush someone or surprise, related perception thing of, I stab someone. And the problem is, is like just the idea of saying, I pull out a knife and stab someone. You might do that outside of an action sequence. But the problem is it's hugely problematic to do that in a game because it, that, that starts a huge snowball. If a player says, I pull out a knife and stab them, a lot of GMs just will start a huge cascade of a bunch of bullshit. Right, and there's a lot of assumptions built into combat, which is things like all opponents are aware usually that they're fighting each other at some point during the fight, and the fight doesn't usually end until every single person is defeated empirically with no other alternative. Well, or even to go even further, if Alpha says, I pull out a knife and stab the guy, okay, Bravo might say, I don't want Alpha to pull out that knife and stab the guy. I want to stop Alpha from doing that. And so, like, suddenly you might say, okay, it's time to roll initiative. And now we have to get Charlie and Delta off their phones because they wake up and say, what? A, a fight? Oh, okay, I'll roll some dice. And then Charlie wins the initiative and goes, okay, what's going on? In which case, like, okay, we totally diffused all the drama of this moment. Because all Alpha wanted to do was stab somebody, and suddenly everyone else has to do something action kind of first. And then Charlie's sitting there going, what do I do to stop him? Kill him? It's a combat. I, I can't do anything. And then we right, have yeah, to... Yeah, your option is very restricted by the verbs in front of you. Right. Suddenly the room is airless. In a way, it wouldn't be if Alpha had done anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... And, and, and I think that's a failure of the way we look at the game design. Yeah. I think it, it's... I mean, one of the things I, I said, and maybe I'm, lo I'm looking to try in my current project to do more cinematic, and I separate action. I always use the term action versus drama, right? Uh, and that's why I came from the definition. Whenever, you know, life and limb is at stake, because I was like, it doesn't have to be somebody pulls a gun, sword, and tries to hack somebody, shoot somebody. It could be, we need to make it to the door before the rolling fireball gets us, right? or whoever gets the hand of the detonator before, you know, the big boom, or what have you, right? It's a point where I need to know where everybody does. And I think I'm using a rule where everybody has to declare their act, their actions, and depending on their declaration, we get to see who can act first. Well, some Rather than... I, I, I want to reinforce here that also it's a, it's a question of when we do something and in the sequence, everyone gets a turn. Because yes. combat, like normally I've seen in gaming, you have combat where everyone gets a turn. And then you have casual time, which is we're just wandering around bullshitting and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've lately seen a rise in uh, what I'm going to call like a montage. I mean, some of the games call it downtime, but you're still doing shit. So I don't know why it's downtime. Uh, where mm -hmm. it's, okay, guys, you went back to base. All of you get to do one or two things. Like you get to build stuff on the base or make some new item or busk for money or reduce some of your sanity and stress. You know, everyone gets to do a thing. So that's like a combat in the fact that we everyone's getting a turn and we care about what everyone's doing. But it's not actually like violent interaction with everyone. Yeah. So it's and I've structured. enjoyed doing that too in the structure of some of my games because it's nice to know that I've gotten around to everyone. I've made sure everyone at the table's been heard. And when it comes to the combat, I think that's also part of why that exists, because you've lamented a few times that in a PBTA game, maybe one person could just shout in a row before anyone else does anything. At least in a structured sequence, everyone has a fair chance to do something. Oh yeah, Alpha would get to pull out their knife and stab the guy, because they said they were doing it, and then they would do it. That's in so fact, in the the combat, it's good because yeah. you have like six seconds to do something, everyone has the same six seconds. In a, a larger campaign sense, it's nice because everyone has a fair share of spotlight. Well, but yeah, I mean, but again, okay. that's not a that's not a combat sequence. But that's why I say, you know, everybody gets to announce and depending on how simple or complex their action is because for me, it's not so much important what you do, but the resolution of that action. Do you get to do it? And what happens next? Well, so, yeah. Well, I mean, in an action sequence, yeah. I mean, I'm talking like structured time versus unstructured time. Mm -hmm, but, yeah. like, one of the weird things that's in gaming is that as soon as it becomes violent, it becomes structure. Like, um, uh, Griffin, were you in the Lancer game? Yes, I was. Beginning yeah, I, I, I remember being confused that a Lancer could get a skill, which is kill an NPC, uh, no questions asked. Um, I'm sure the comments section is going to fill people saying, that's not how that works. 
Um, <laughs> no, no, that's exactly what it says it works. It's like you're going oh, to kill people. Said. Here's three different abilities to do so, and we're going to assume you're using these outside of your mech when you're not doing a mission. Uh, apparently, outside the mission, I could just get. I mean, that was news to me. That I've never seen a game before where, I, and I just killed somebody off screen. I, I the only game I've seen do that is D and D one. Um, At the same time, I am also I'm also fascinated by it. So I'm, I'm interested um, in diving into it deep at some. Point. I, I I think I think it invokes something that um, uh, I think it's one of those things that they didn't think through because it, it's one of those um, uh, I, I I wanted to be a sneaky character and there wasn't any stealth ability but there were like a bunch of different abilities that you kill somebody off screen, um, <laughs> which uh, sends a message. Well, it, I'm always talking about formal versus informal. Here is a mm-hmm. rule in the book, a formally written rule that says you get a die roll, you get a bonus to a die roll to do this specific thing. And I'm always like mm-hmm. after the idea that if the rules, you know, say something, they're endorsing it. It's like this is a game where you kill people off screen. Um, you know, we have a rule for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have it's to. It's one of the verbs they built their game. Uh, I think I just wanted to be a sneak, but um, the um. The thing about like like the combat thing here is like I I like the idea that some sometimes I think time should be structured. Like I was complaining about Power by the Apocalypse, where if your entire game is just whoever shouts first gets to do something, you are going to wind up with a game where the shouty people do everything. And if you have some people at the table who are not as shouty, they're not going to get screen time unless they're called upon. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, a good yeah. MC is going to know to call upon those. And a lot of people say, well, a good MC would know to do this. I'm saying, I would agree. It doesn't say that anywhere in the book, and it repeatedly like as examples of shouty people. So yeah, it's go ahead. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hidden rule, right? It's like the thing that everybody's supposed to know. Therefore, we didn't write it, and that we should have. Maybe. And and I think maybe if you look at like uh, some other games where they don't have those same formalisms, when it's unstructured time, people will kind of <laughs> shout over each other, or at least talk over each other, and get more light than others when that time is unstructured just because they have more ideas or more things to say or they're just really good at pushing people to the side. Right. And, and, and I guess to get back on topic, like one thing that was bothering me is the idea that violence cannot happen out of structured time. Like, mm-hmm. like for example, especially in a game like Urban Jungle, a player might go off to do some sort of errand by themselves. You know, yeah, because you might split up. If you have cars mm-hmm. and phones. You might split up. Yeah. Um, and if they went off and someone threatened them with violence, like they got, you know, like someone shows up with a gun and says, okay, I'll be taking that Maltese Falcon off your hands. Um, that is the that, potential. That has to be a whole sequence. Well, does it though? I mean, like, does that's it though. Right. Well, no, it depends. That's kind of the yeah, here's a fun because, thing. Because if you just surrender the, the Falcon, then there is no gun. Oh, right. Uh, we're uh, assuming uh, that there's no the what... because we're talking about it. Yeah, I'm not saying, lessons. what world do you live in that players surrender? <laughs> well, that's uh, true, that's true. But, you know, I, I so. think that the, the reason it has to be that way, first of all, is because of the stakes. You could lose your character, right? And nobody wants to, like, oh, somebody showed up, you said no, boom, you got your hair blown off. Next, and you're like, well, I didn't it's get a chance to do say. anything, you know? Because yeah. technically, you can't die in Urban Jungle, because Urban Jungle dying is an optional rule. Now, um, I mean, true, but in most games, you, in most games, yeah. in most games, you do. Uh, you know, if you get right. into in, combat, in, in most games, in fact, that's a, like I'm glad you brought that up because that, that's also a complaint about a lot of modern games. Like only tabletop games kill you. In a computer game, they have to go out of their way to explain what death is, and I don't think there's been a computer game in a long time that's had permadeath. Um, like Diablo three had to have different warning screens that say don't contact our admins to get your permadeath carry. And also, permadeath wasn't yeah. much permadeath in Diablo 3. They just took you out of hardcore mode and put you back in normal mode. Right, because people will will be upset when they lose everything. We know all this. But, so, there is a game that does have death, and does have provisions for a rule where you could have a single-step combat. A something that is unstructured, where both sides roll their dice, and then you get a result. And that is Vampire. There is, in fact, a rule provision that you roll your fighting, and they roll their fighting, and then whoever's the loser gets one of two or maybe three statuses, where they are afraid and run away, they get somewhat injured, and then, of course, obviously, you could maybe have dead somewhere in there. But I think the implication is that you want the story to keep going, want them to lose quickly, and it's done. Well, and I see why they did that. You just did a formal roll, and that's That's a dueling rule, basically. 
Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that, that's that's important because as we were discussing in previous threads, it's like, look, if you're a Bruja, you're good at combat. So it's like, you know, hammer theory is I'll solve everything with what I'm good at. And you can't tell somebody in the vampire game, we let you buy celerity and potence. By the way, you can't use it to solve any problem. Uh, like you're not allowed to use to solve it. You're not allowed to use it. And you can't do that to folks. On the other hand, it's the it's an it's an elegant solution to a problem of um we don't want to take up half the game. You want to take up a whole half hour of you going hand to hand with somebody else. Yeah, and we do ostensibly have that context where vampires supposedly focus on the social political uh role play and a combat would get in the way of that if that's exactly what you're here for, right? Well, it's it's this weird thing of where games will bring up intrigue. With the idea that, by the way, assassination is never a part of injury, which is <laughs> like, it, 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 you, you can't do that because no, assassination and violence are a huge part of injury. I did lamp shade something earlier, which was the role to seduce people in formal combat turns too, and it turns out vampire has a role rule for that too. That's or at least something ostensibly there, social roles where players have where characters have doors, which is an HP equivalent. And you're trying to get through enough of them to finally get that request to come through. Doors. The only thing that's is these turns works. happen in terms of weeks or months. Um, well, that that's getting into, instead of calling them door, uh, uh, let's call them clubs. It is that's still a functionally a social combat, which is what I find hilarious. It is a well, formalized, turn-based way of handling. Well, but you say it, you, it has to happen every weeks or month. We could just call that, like, uh, the word I'm going to use is clock, because that's what Blades in the Dark called it. Clock I think that would probably be it. more yeah. appropriate, but we can right. see where all these ideas are blended together. On then the you have to, it's, a, it's a long-term activity. Well, because unstructured stuff, um, uh, yeah, it's a question of whether it should be structured, and a question of how structured is it, because on the one hand, you want to be able to do stuff. Um, yeah, and I think that's one of the huge problems is the idea that um, uh, it's this weird bias in gaming where violence, violent altercations get the huge mm. treatment sequence, whereas action sequences of running away from a fight or dealing with a disaster or stuff Lessons was talking about is like an afterthought. Like, like what game actually discusses an action sequence? Yeah. Right, exactly. I think well, it's about the ones I wrote, but... uh, ex it's about expanding it rather than in some cases. Also, you can have a situation, for example, I was playing um, Blaze in the Dark, and that game is heavily structured everywhere. And to me, especially the sort of non-mission profile thing, it felt too, it, it felt clunky. Maybe I didn't, my mind didn't make the shift. That can also happen. But it felt so clunky because it's like, can I just not talk to somebody? I just, just I don't want to, but like, I have to do this in order to get, you know, I just want to walk into a bar and talk to somebody, right? Well, Blaze in the Dark I get, I get that you're trying to tell me I never play the game. This is what you should be doing. But on the other hand, it's like I kind of know that I have to get information. I just want to talk to a guy in the yeah. The but Bla yeah. Blades in the Dark has a weird situation. I would describe in it where it is so bored of planning. But like, yeah. they're, they're so worried. Like I, on the one hand, I know that players can often, if it's unstructured time, we're getting away from combat here, I guess. But if it's unstructured time, they can wander around and like I want to buy a bar. Uh, or I'm going to go ask every single little question I can about buying my own new inventory. I'm going to haggle the price of every single thing. Oh, my God. Uh, so, <laughs> right. And when it's unstructured like that, it can cause problems. But on the other hand, Blades in the Dark is also, um, uh, it's not a caper game is what I discovered when playing it. Like, there's no planning phase. You pick one strategy. Is it assault? Is it stealth? Pick one of these. All right, after you pick that, tell me how you're doing it. Um, I, I guess we're going in the front door. All right, let's do it. And yeah. everything's a flashback. By the way, flashbacks kill you. Um, so <laughs> it, it was like, it's like so bored now, which is like, whereas I think Lessons and I were having the thing of, you know, I, we'd like to case the joint out and, and organically get into it. So maybe if there was structure for that, we would enjoy it. But no, there was downtime and mission and everything was rigidly structured. And yeah. uh, there wasn't any casual at all. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's like an example of, I think the game goes way too far on that yeah. because I, I think, um, well, technically the mission was it's, it's powered by the apocalypse shout out and take your turns in whatever order you want. Mm -hmm. But you I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. It was like, you're all, like, there was uh, when we were playing it and praise to the GM for running it, but there was like, he started to soften up and give us like, there might be something between mission and downtime like there might be you know 
There might be actual organic time period. Yeah. Right. And, and so I, and I, don't I can think... understand, like, maybe why you would design a game away from that, because that means having a lot of content prepared, having a lot of questions ready to answer. If you're going to case a join, I should be ready to maybe give you some answers on that. But uh, if, I, I'm just going to say, just make yeah, a no, it for it. It feels like I'm going to prepare that. anything. I'm a running, I'm running Shadow Run, and in Shadow Run, essentially, you have to make basically a session for planning. And I get this feeling that uh, I don't remember the name of the person who wrote this. Like, no, I don't want to waste the entire session casing a joint and asking some soup. No, I want you to do it. I know what yeah. you're going to do. You, there's only so many questions you can ask. There's only so much information you're going to get before you do it. I want you to do it. So just, you know, you know, pick the 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 the, the points in the in the spreadsheet and just get the, get it done, right? And move on, right? And that well, to me felt a little, you know, forced. In theory. Mechanical. In theory, time was supposed to be more plastic. Like in theory, in in Blades in the Dark, if you wanted to case the joint, the way you would do it is you would say, "Okay, we show up, and I will have to case the joint in a flashback." At least say, "Okay, previously I came here and investigated some stuff. What did I find?" And in theory, that sounds great. But in practice, the problem was flashbacks did stress points to your character. So and you have a limited number, and if you roll poorly during the mission, you go down some, and like you said, in that game, you will die. In, in other words, the mere act of wanting to do my mission, you know, in other, like ma- feeling like a proper organized crime person, case the joint, study it up and go in. The mere act of preparing for a mission, which is one of my favorite parts, was punitive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there'll be some people who say like, a flashback doesn't have to cost stress points, it's optional. It's like, yes, it might be optional, but the fact that it says... It, the fact that it formally says in the rules this is what happens means that and it's there. The fact that it says it's zero, one, or two, and the fact that our GM was always charging for them, you know, like, um, yeah. uh, uh, it's it, you know, it, it struck me as, as like it was a game for uh, for people who wanted to get a lot done in a big hurry, and it was pretty good at that. Um, mm-hmm. It's um, uh, uh, I think it um, we're getting really sidetracked with the combat thing. I think we all oh, agree. Exactly. No, no, but I think we, we all agreed here, like, like that's a big problem. I, I would like to talk about some of my problems with the concept of initiative, because initiative bugs the shit out of me. All um, right, so what is your problem with putting everyone into a big, structured list? That's not my problem. My problem is, is that initiative is, it's random who actually starts the fight. Like, I opened this with the example of Alpha wanted to stab somebody, but Charlie and Delta, who didn't even want to start a fight, rolled higher on their initiative. So for some reason, Charlie is in some adrenaline crazed mode and is getting to take his action first, despite the fact that he wasn't even involved. Now we can go back, go back to our earlier perception thing is, well, maybe people have to make perception roles before they're allowed to take initiative. And that's a huge thorny like thing going on. That would have been good for our perception talk, which is like, okay, so only players who said they were alert and watching for danger We'll have to make random rolls to see if they're allowed to make another random roll to see if they can participate in the fight. And that, that goes back to a previous point of ours yeah. of punishing the players for not defining every single thing that they've ever done and not being vigilant, which we just discussed. You don't want to do that. Well, you'll get players, I mean, you'll get minimaxers who put all their points in perception because failing a perception roll means not getting agency. You'll and get players you'll... who will stand up and say, no, I was doing this the whole time, I swear. I was watching everyone yeah. this whole time, right. And, and mm-hmm. the surprise mechanic. It's this weird thing where Beta technically started the fight, but everyone sort of interrupted. And you're using initiative uh, as as a combination of perception and reflexes at the same time. Because technically, um, you know, in order to seize the initiative, you would have to see a fight was going on. And so you get in this weird situation where dexterity uh, is, you know, highly motivated because it's when you go first. So it's both the ability to see a fight and in almost every role-playing game, the ability to interact because it's ranged combat and your defenses. Yeah. It, yeah. Again, oh, that's There's why I, I propose right the design of, you know, you say what you're going to do, right? And based on the complexity of what you're going to do, you go you can go first or, or later, right? Um, How because complex if you, is it to pull out a knife and stab somebody? Simple. So you go first. So if I want right, to interrupt case, you, I have to do something equally beta's simple Beta's complaint of, of Beta wants to stop Alpha from doing it. You just tell Beta you can't. No, it depends beta's what they want to do. Because they want to be- yeah. Beta uh, has to do something equally as simple. And you would need an interrupt rule. 
uh, right. I mean, first of all, you, you would need yeah. an interrupt rule for this, and usually mm-hmm. the way the games would handle this would be an initiative check. And like I said, the problem is as soon as you as soon as you announce there's an initiative role going on, you set off the whole table because as soon as you ring the bell to say we're doing initiative, everyone at the table has to roll initiative to participate because a fight has started, and that's my usual firestorm of this because this is alpha and beta getting into their little tiff, but you, Charlie, Delta, and Echo over there, if they rolled higher on their initiatives, we get to go first. Yeah, and that, there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be, a, I think. I, I would just get rid of the roll. Um, I would but just you can't go because Beta wants to go first. Uh, no, I mean, Beta would never, would never be able to stop Alpha. It, it wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to go first. He would have to interrupt Alpha. Right, but how do you interrupt? Like, what is that? I don't know. He would try to tackle him or something, right? Uh, but that's a combat. A hard, so it's yeah, another way that gets to go it's first without rolling initiative. That's what this is. This is a nightmare. That's I mean, you, well, you just let Beta I mean, go first think, without rolling initiative. Oh, I was not thinking that the thing the situation is that Alpha wants to do something. It's what Alpha wants to do something that everybody agrees on or not. Alpha disagrees. Alpha wants to stab the guy. Exactly. And I so, think that's so beta why you do it. Uh, and that's, I think, that's why that's that's the issue. Because if it, if Beta says, "I want to stab somebody," you know, like everybody was like, "Okay, whatever," that's it. The guy goes. Yeah, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm using this as another example. One player wants to do something that would mm-hmm. be a violent action that other players would want to stop or interfere with, and it turns into this. You where other characters don't care, but you still have to do it as a big giant combat, and it can be ugly and messy. I would meet some GM. Does everybody be- have? Does also in this case. You I mean, you're saying like, to act. does everyone have to? And the answer is no. I mean, you. Some player groups are looking at me. Don't have a problem with this. Alpha would just stab the guy, and we would be done. But uh, I'm talking about some other situations where, like I said, I'm describing. I think more often than not, this could turn into a big conflagration because Beta could be yelling that they want the initiative role because they want to get participated. Some of the other players might yell, "Hey, I'm at the table too. I get to roll initiative." The rules say that. I'm talking about I've seen this blow up more than once. One player decides to do a violent... And then the big header of all of this, because you had players roll initiative, suddenly it's combat time. The mere act of one player doing something violent has made the table erupt into violence because Charlie fires up the Solarian shell and Delta goes ahead and summons up their necromantic orb and suddenly the entire place just erupts into violence because one player drew a knife and tried to stab somebody and... um, now, I do I mean, have a similar tangent I don't, on the scenario. I, to, don't to, have kind to, of to me, actually, I don't see that as a problem. Maybe well, I'm not seeing it. I don't see it as a problem. That's a problem. It's like you've never I, seen like, four teenagers yeah. argue with each other about who goes first. I mean, yes, I, but that's what, that's what the initiative is about. Well, it, you it, get it, to decide who gets first, right? I, I mean, like, the problem is, is like, there's almost to, no way for Beta to actually quietly stop Alpha from doing something that they also thought they were doing quietly. The, this gets back to our imperfect information. The mere act of starting a fight tells players to roll initiative. The mere act that they're rolling initiative tells them a fight has started. Even if Charlie and Delta couldn't perceive it because they're near enough to get involved, they immediately know a fight has started. And I actually have had a similar situation to that recently, and I think I mentioned the story of one player is about to die by succubus, and I'm counting rounds, and I go, well, you have about 10 rounds to do something, and that's immediately information on the table that, yeah, you you need to go do something. You can't just pretend you don't know because it's too far away. Well, At you, some yeah. point, that, that becomes something that they have to do. And it's weird. Do they get 10, because it's combat time, they get 10 rolls to detect it, whereas if this was casual time, they'd only get one? Right, and that's a question that I don't think any RPG answers ever. Well, not usually. But again, we go back to the idea that it's violence, it's an action, and we want to know who acts when. Because if the question is, we want to know who acts first, then we go into initiative. Right. And we, but we whether, also, whether, and we go into the action. Right. And that's what I'm Right. And about. we also have, a, I mean, I'm, I'm glad Griffin brought this up because now we have the funny thing going on of, because we declared it was an action combat sequence, they get 10 rolls to do it. But if we hadn't, it would only be one. And yeah. te- making one out of 10 rolls is a lot easier than making one out of one rolls. So just the mere act of doing this changed it. And like the mere act of changing something to a combat situation 
Uh, like, this is one of my huge problems with Call of Cthulhu, if people have seen this, because in Call of Cthulhu, I might get one library use roll to figure out what's going on in the library, but I get to shoot three times around. Right, and inevitably you'll be better shooting than looking through the library, despite that being a core concept. I'll make that roll more often, because I get three yep. times. Uh, yeah, now, I mean, yeah, reward it more skill, I got yeah, yeah. I got something I'd want to share. So let's let's revisit the stabbing situation from a different perspective. We have our thief. He wants to stab people in the back because he doesn't want to start a fight because he's trying to silently assassinate everyone because that's what a rogue should be doing, right? right. But if he fails, it's going to start a big fight that nobody wants. Yeah. And in fact, uh, in some systems such as D and D, you can't even pull off an assassination. Because the NPC will have 80 HP, but you're rolling a backstab, so you have like 46, so you'll never successfully do you would, it you would have the to limits jump, proposed. You would have to jump through so many hoops to get it done. Trust me, we've thought yeah. that. Exactly. It, it becomes a point where nobody wanted the fight, but now the fight is here because there's not a way around it. Well, I, sh I should flip around and say, like, you can, one of the paradoxes of gaming, like, like the, or like most tabletop games, is you can always start a fight. Anytime you want. Anytime you want, you start pulling out weapons and we'll roll initiative and immediately fall into formal stuff. Um, you might have an ultra casual group where you'll have some players say, I will sit this out and not take turns. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but I will say that you've got, you do have the problem that if a fight does happen, any player can chime in and say, I want to kill things too. And any of your game, and, and this is backed up by like, I keep pointing like critical role dimension 20. These games have a reputation for all of them being violent idiots that mm -hmm. like solve all their problems through violence and outbreaks because it's that easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what's available to them in terms of the game. And even as much as they improv out of it, they they're still within a box of some kind. Well, it, it's it's the way the game is set up. Like I'm glad to see Vampire. I mean, we're already on fifth edition. Maybe it was an earlier one, but Vampire is at least making headrows to say of letting you resolve it, but not making it complex. Like the idea of let's do one roll to resolve the whole thing. Because usually you don't do one roll. Like the original, like D&D &D grew out of miniatures games. Back in miniatures games, it was one roll. Like one tank battalion hits another tank battalion, one roll, see how the whole fucking thing played out. And they, you know, when they got to uh, Chainmail, the man to man combat game, they thought, well, if everyone only has one guy and two guys bounce off of each other and one roll resolves the whole thing. This is not very interesting as far as combat goes, because dying in one hit, you know, thanks for coming by and making, you know, like your tournament, you were eliminated in the first round. Um, so they come up, came up with the idea of hit points to make it more interesting. And that way, tactics might play out because you have to make multiple rolls. The more rolls you make, the more it rewards strategy over randomness. Yeah, instead mm -hmm. of a binary, you have a small spectrum of some kind. Right. Which does develop to the problem where now we start adding skill rolls or ability checks or proficiencies into the picture. Now we've got the problem where I've already complained about where if I only get to make one of these rolls, then it's highly random. Like the thing I was always bitching about is I leveled a character up in D&D 3rd Edition from 1 to 20, and that entire career I made five move silently checks in my entire fucking career. So, you know, and, you know, out of those, I failed four of those roles because, because you know, you were good at it. I made dozens, if, on, if not hundreds of attack roles, but I only made, no, I like was a thief. I had, like, I could put more and more points into it and mm -hmm, like, yeah. it, it, but it doesn't matter because you make one roll and as if you fail the first roll, we're fucking done. So the, I have a theory. I have a statement. So then is a combat, a combat because it is no longer a binary of that's interesting if anything that is on a spectrum where you are trying to go between one end and the other is that a comp i think maybe that's a better way to look at it rather than simply it being combat or not combat it's the spectrum of how formal are we going how fine into our details do I, I, we go? I want to take this a little further saying it, 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 it yeah, becomes a combat that... to... oh go ahead does that include things like build rules? Like if your system has well, a, that's what that's uh, why we're building on. Yeah, a so. combat is a structured situation that everyone is participating in, and we will not finish it until it is resolved. Mm -hmm. Like you, when you get into a fight, someone's gonna die. Yeah, tell me, tell me all about people running. No one runs away from. Them. Like players <laughs> never run away because they don't have enough movement points to do so. And like, what would I do? Not attack a certain round. And villains never run away because if a villain runs away, the players will pursue them with the hatred of a thousand suns. 
Damn. Um, oh, oh my, so, my villains would run away and keep running and running. Well, in your shadow run game, they might get in a car and it might be a little difficult. But like some of you know what I'm talking about. Some players yes. will gleefully yeah. run into the wilderness. The so moving Surrender is not an option. I mean, on the one hand, the, the issue I have with the combat is you ring the bell and everyone participates. Whereas building something or like that kind of like structured thing, the clock, the nice part about the idea of here is a progress bar and when it completes, the thing is done. You don't necessarily do all that in one go. Like you say, okay, I'm going to go work on this. Okay, I got two ticks or 40% in the progress. Now I'll get back to my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then we'll work on this in the next structured time. And that's one of the big moves that you're seeing in a lot of these games like PBTA and Blades in the Dark where somebody can be, I'm working on a long-term project, but I'm also participating in the game. Like every now and then we stop, take a structured beat, work on our little projects, and then come back to the game. I and think that is a, a really good defining point between combat and other structured times, wherein it's an activity that has to conclude and we're not leaving it until it is concluded. Whereas like a lot of tasks in life, you can, in fact, as you said, set down, go do something else, and come back to it. I mean, it was one of the big problems with skill challenges in D&D, &D, because some players, like, were a no... Like, it's weird. Like, if a combat starts, everyone in D&D &D had combat power, so everyone had something to do. But when you went a skill challenge, it was like, okay, guys, we need five successes before three failures. Everyone come up to the table. Like, uh, like I don't remember skill challenges saying everyone had to participate, but I did receive feedback from people saying, I felt like I had to participate and was being set up to fail which is weird. You think they would just say, I'm not, skip me, I'm not going to do anything. But they didn't feel like some of the way it was worded, they didn't feel like that. And it then kind of felt like combat. It kind of felt yeah. like combat. Um, I had so these something. skill challenges would technically qualify as, quote, a combat that you participated in, but you're not good at anything. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I mean, a party would count as a combat because you're not leaving until it's over. Well, I mean, I could I could see where someone might just say, okay, I'm going to sit this one out, or even better, assist someone, but the assist is mm -hmm. not moving on. Um, there yeah. is the, there's the weirdness in Burning Wheel, where anything anything you want to do in Burning Wheel turns into a disposition thing. Ooh, yeah. um, where I think it's a grind. It's right. a grind, yeah. It's a grind. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a pointless grind. It's not the Burning Wheel, it's a grinding wheel. I, I think this is a fair statement against making literally everything a highly formalized affair where you're going into depth on well, it. So I, I do want to put there. Don't do that. I, I do like the idea of formali uh, of formalizing spotlight. I think what we talked about spotlight being when a player yes. gets to do something, and the idea that you will get to do something and then we'll move on to someone else. Like in my role playing games, I've constantly talked about splitting up the party because I, I get so pissed off. When they say, oh, splitting up the party is death. It's like, no, fuck you. Some of you are streetwise and some of you don't. Some of you are going to go mm -hmm. talk to the Thieves Guild and some of you aren't. Shut the fuck Sometimes up. Sometimes there's a lot of things for you to do and you shouldn't all be in the same place doing it all at the same time. You should split up and actually diver right, but tackle the, multiple But challenges. the problem is because it wasn't combat, it wasn't structure. And so a lot of GMs didn't know what to do. And so you'd have the problem where the hacker character or you know the streetwise character would start asking lots of questions. And I noticed this, like that one player, that this is what they want to do. It's their time to shine. They'll keep asking questions and there's no timer or there's no conclusion to it. So they can wind up like, you know, like this is the joke about Shadowrun. The hacker suddenly absorbs the game for 90 minutes. There's no specific time limit of when this kind of ends or whatever. So the player would sit there and do all this stuff. And then the other players have unstructured time. They don't have anything on their calendars worded as something they can do. It doesn't say, okay, go here to reduce stress or go here to buy new stuff or just busk for coins and just make money doing odd jobs. There was nothing structured for them to do. And so the players felt like this is a waste of my time. Whereas this new trend that we're seeing of, okay, let's have you know a montage segment, downtime segment, where player each of you pick a thing to do then the one player who wants to do something that's complicated can do that. And the other players can just say, well, I'm just going to go, I'll just go get some new yen. I'll just ro randomly roll there. I, I got 400 new yen. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. I think having like a static thing for people to say, I waste my time doing this, a default action is probably a good thing. If you're going to do these sort of informal, what are you doing across the day or week situations? And I, right, feel, I, mean, that, I, I, I feel like D&D &D missed the opportunity to really double down on profession or craft 
being that thing. Or training. I mean, that was or one training. of the... Mm-hmm. And training, as, yeah, used to be the thing. As I'm fond of pointing out, it used to be that in D&D, after the mission, you didn't level up unless you trained. That was partly because doing all the math and how much you leveled up was a big pain in the ass. Also, they thought it was unrealistic you could level up in the middle of the night. Remember, the entire idea of I stabbed something and then a light shined on my head and I immediately became level four in the middle was deemed that if that happened to players, they would quit the game in disgust because that was too unrealistic. <laughs> oh, how they are so wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. So, right. So the idea was that you had to go back and, sp- and take that money that you earned because you didn't just want to get experience points. You also had to get enough money to justify leveling up. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, now that the game has changed to where like the only way you level up is through murder. Um, uh, yeah, they, they re- there's nothing to do in downtime. There's no crafting. There's none of that. There's no stronghold building. Uh, I don't know what spell jammer is for. Um, <laughs> and, and the I mean, idea of- it kind of is, but not really. It's very, very- but it's always kind of is, but not really. It's always like enough yeah, for someone that. to say, actually, there's a sidebar that if you wasted a lot of time and did something that was completely mm-hmm. tedious and unfun, you would eventually get to introduce in the game so the game master could nerf it because we just had our minimaxing discussion. So, yeah. Uh, moving on. So, um, yeah. So, the I, I think we're all in agreement that players should get a fair shake to be able to, to exert themselves. But, no, I think what came up here is, like, a lot of you were talking about, like, sometimes everyone should get a turn. And, and, and I think... Uh, um, yeah, it's actually changed from what I was complaining about, which was like, uh, I was complaining that anytime a fight happens, suddenly we have to go into formal land, but really we just started talking about maybe other shit should be formalized. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't, I, I, to me, I see, well, I don't see the problem because it's part of the challenge as well. I mean, if somebody wants to stab somebody, it's like, I think the thing is the stabbing is like, I want to do this unmolested and unchallenged. Well, I, I think, think the way that's that's, like, that's what that's what I feel the problem. Is. And, and I would go back to it. Somebody interrupt me, like eh, <laughs> we're always on staff. Uh, I mean, I'm using that as an example, but I would quote my buddy. You know, I quote my my not my buddy, my 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 idol, Aaron Alston, uh, who uh, said, "If everyone in your game is violent, there's not a problem with violence." Uh, which is the the problem is is that uh, there there's this overarching mentality that if you ever want the game to turn into a violent bloodbath, you can do that at any time really easily, consequence mm-hmm. free. Uh, that that uh, vi- violence also that violence will be more interesting than nonviolence. Like nonviolence will be unstructured. We do whatever we want. I don't know when my next turn is going to come up. I don't know what to do. I'm going to get lost on my phone reading the dank memes. Whereas combat is structured and it will call on everyone for a turn therefore combat is when game is happening and it's when like things are on the line everything is intense whereas non-combat you know i should i don't even need to be paying attention to it i can't be killed yeah. non-combat. And, and i think that's part of my own push towards formalizing more of the game because yeah a lot of time people will feel unengaged they won't know what to do they don't have a goal and so they kind of tune out because they don't understand what they want to do or maybe they just don't have a want yet because they haven't presented or, or you'll, you'll get in the weirder situation which is if alpha really wants to kill the guy alpha is going to have to concoct a situation where they're alone because if they know if there's even one player with them it's going to turn to a huge to do and then the other players will say well we can't let you go alone and um <laughs> you know because I, yeah. I don't trust you which as i've discovered is not a problem because in 90 percent of the games i've been in the players never split up for any reason whatsoever <laughs> so um that's why i'm glad to see that trend ending with the idea of downtime which is okay i can go do the shit uh, you can you know, live your own life away from these particular three people i i can do like if if i built a thief character even though i don't get to do thief things during the combat and stuff at least there's a downtime action where i can say okay i went off and did a thief yeah, you yeah. pay your guild, your guild dues and talk to, you know... Well, I got to go steal some shit. I guess yeah. that's also something to pin down at some point. If you're not doing something, are you really that role at some point? But well, that, that, that's, that's where I get role. frustrated. Because, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, we've talked about being versus doing before. And, and the idea that, um, you know, like... Like, I w- that's what kind of was complaining with the minimaxing type thing, is I would build characters who would take things like diplomacy and stealth and craft but those, if those are never coming up, then we're not doing that shit. Then I'm not doing any of that. And so I, w- I would do this incredibly meta thing that I know people would give me shit over. 
uh, of showing up at the game with I only bought stuff that matters. I mean, it was kind of my complaint about mm -hmm. you know, Forbidden Lands, but I, mean, I think I think we're all pretty much in, in on the same page. Uh, that uh, I, th I think if we had to come to summarize all of this, I think we come away from it is I, I think uh, um, well we should have structured time, but I think one of the huger problems that we didn't talk about that wraps all this up is we also should get away from pass fail roles because as, yes. as Griffin as, as Griffin discussed, uh, if you fight somebody out of combat or whatever, you make a role, and the gradations of how well you make that role determine how many things that happen. The huge problem is with roles being too pass-fail, uh, then you run into the skill challenge problem we already talked about. If you can make a role to see, did you do minorly good, really good, or awesomely good to resolve something off-screen or in a step, you know, now it's more interesting than just pass-fail. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and lessons, do you have anything you'd like to conclude that off with as your final statement, too? I think if we go back to the mechanics, perhaps I do like, uh, you know, particularly the initiative role. I, I, am, I actually like it. I may like the idea of initiative, but perhaps sometimes it's one of those things where it should not be randomized in every, every single situation. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, then. So I think for today, that's all for Notes from the Aleph. We stream episodes bi-weekly Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can come join us live at Twitch at twitch.tv slash Ractus. We also stream and record weekly tabletop games at the same channel. And you can come join us when we start at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays and Wednesdays. Norman Rafferty here is a partner and writer for Sanguine Games. Check out sanguinegames.com and join us on the Reddit and Twitter and look forward to the upcoming Book of Coral's Iron Claw expansion book. Uh, be sure to check out Lessons Learned at Lessons Learned 1 on YouTube and Twitch. And be sure to check him out over on Amazon and check out all of his wonderful works as well. And of course, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and come see us all again. Until next time, everybody.